folks, welcome to our discovery class. We're in our second week of our study of the book of Exodus out of Egypt. We're taking some major themes in the book of Exodus. Uh, last week, if you remember, we did kind of a background back into Genesis. Really, We really went all the way back to Adam and brought up to Joseph. And so now we're beginning at chapter one. So let's pray together and we'll jump right in this morning. God, we do thank you for the way you love us, the way you care for us. God, I pray that you speak through us today. May our stu this study of Exodus that we're all involved in right now, that uh, you will use uh, the experiences and the happenings of the Israelites in the midst of Egypt, through the life of Moses, through the life of Aaron, through the life of the people as they, uh, as they wander through the wilderness. God, I pray that you use the lessons that they learn and allow them to apply, uh, apply these principles and these truths to our own life. And uh, may you be honored in the midst of it. And um, as we always pray, may the words of our mouth, uh, of Carol's and I's teaching, and the collective meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good. Well, good morning. Um, okay, so we're doing today Exodus 1 through 4 with a we're kind of the focus on chapter 3, but we're going to Back it up to one since we already backed it way up last week. And in chapter one, it, it opens up. They're still, the Israelites are still in Goshen, okay? And Goshen is where they went when the, the, the family came with Joseph there. But it's now many years later, almost 400 years later. Nobody remembers Joseph anymore. Nobody remembers basically why they came and how they helped save the land during the famine. That's all forgotten. There's a new Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is just, it's not, don't think it's the same guy. That's, it's a title, like President of the United States. Pharaoh is what it's called over there, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, all of a sudden, this guy, Pharaoh, says, hey, there's a lot of these uh, Israelites way out in Goshen here, and we, we believe, because in the Exodus, there were over 600,000 men, and mm -hmm. so that there's probably over 2 million of them at this point, and also, all of a sudden, Pharaoh says, Wow, if an enemy attacks us and these guys ally with the enemy, they're going to overtake us, even though we, you know, we're, we're in charge in this land. So he says to his slave taskmasters, okay, put these guys under, under your charge and, and be, be pretty mean to them, really. And so that that's... Which probably means, just jump in here real quick. She doesn't like it when I do that. No, no, please. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Which probably means when the Pharaoh said to his taskmasters to put these the Israelites underneath them, that at that point they probably weren't underneath them. Right. They were they still were, shepherding. They were probably shepherds. They were probably, as you know, they were living in Goshen, but they were probably seen as, I won't necessarily, but for lack of a better word, equal in citizenry to the Egyptians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the Pharaoh said, they're getting too great, so now let's make them slaves. So if you didn't think Pharaoh was kind of a bad guy, you're going to see he's really a bad guy. The first thing he says to the, and where two of the Israelite midwives are named, Shipra and Pua, and I said to John, I really want to meet them in heaven someday. He basically goes to them and says, if a baby is born and it is a male, kill it, and if it's a female, let it live. What's he trying to do? Decrease the number of soldiers in, in the area. And so these two ladies lie, and I know John wants to jump in on this, so let me just say that that, that is start, the starting thing. These two ladies lie, and I think that God in heaven was cheering on that lie because they, weren't, they were taking a stand. They were not going to kill boy babies. And then when Pharaoh sees that the boy babies are not being killed, that's when the edict is given to throw every boy baby in the Nile. And just so you know, Niles are full of, at that point, of crocodiles. And so he not only was drowning them, if they didn't get drowned initially, there were going to be crocodile bait. So I'm going to toss the ball back before we get to chapter two. But he was a, this pharaoh was a real bad dude. Yeah, and, and, and let me just even paint a worse picture of him. And, and, it, and looking at verse 16, okay. I, I think this is just one of those passages of Scripture in the Bible that I, I just find interesting when you start doing word studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and verse 16 in the New International, says, New International Version 
says, and when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him, and if it's a girl, let her live. Now, the, the actual, the word them is not in the Hebrew text. So the actual reading of the verse in Hebrew says, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe on the delivery stool. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have the word them. And another interesting fact, that word delivery stool in Hebrew is only used twice in the New Testament. He was, and, he's and, so excited to and, tell you about and, this. <laughs> and I, she, you know where the other one is used? Did you say twice in the New Testament? Tw I'm sorry, twice in the Old Testament. Only twice in the Old Testament. I don't even want to try and guess where the other one is. The other used. time this Hebrew word afnium, is, and I'm saying that phonetically because I don't... I got to spit all over the place if I try to say it. Maybe the word, the Hebrew word is, is afnium in a kind of a transliteration into English. The other place it's used is Jeremiah 18.3. And I had it open, but I lost. Here we go. Jeremiah 18.3 reads this and see if you can find the word. Jeremiah 18.3 says, and when I, so I went to the potter's house and I saw him working at the potter's wheel. I think it's the potter's wheel. The potter's <laughs> wheel. It, 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 the, the word is the potter's wheel. And so we have to ask, I have to ask my question, why did the translator of Exodus choose to translate potter's wheel as delivery stool and add the word them in it? So... And as I read, read there's books, whole books about this one Can I verse. Tell you he's going to get excited. <laughs> as I read books about this, what those who study Egyptian liter literature say this is meaning is is that there was a Egyptian god named Kanum who was the creator of humanity. And Kanum actually, in Egyptian religious, I guess we could say mythology, not spirituality, Kanum shaped human forms on a pottery wheel. On a potter's wheel. And Kanum, as he shaped these infants and these fetuses, to use our word, on a potter's wheel, he would give them characteristics and traits and and sexuality, and and he would Kanum would would form them on a potter's wheel, and when he finished forming this fetus, this gestating fetus, he the 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 baby was born, mm -hmm. and so what Egypt people who study Egyptian mythology and spirituality and then the Exodus say what this verse is saying was to the Hebrew midwives when you do your prenatal exam and you find out that it's a male child that Kanum is forming on the potter's wheel basically abort the male child and allow the female child to live. You know, they said, you know, as the books that I read said, the Egyptian early medical, they had ways of determining sexuality like we do of, of a fetus. And so he was saying, when you, when you do your prenatal exam and you find out that it's a male, abort it, basically. And if it's a female child, fetus, allow it to live. And, and so the Hebrew midwives were saying, when we go do our prenatal exams, the babies are already born. They're more healthy than us Egyptian women, and they don't need the midwives. And by the time we get there, the babies are already born. So they could be lying, or they could not be lying. They could be completely honest. And it also confirms that if you have this guy who's a pharaoh that's in charge of the people, he was seemingly okay with their excuse. If they were lying, I think he would be not okay. But if they were telling the truth, that by the time we get there, the women are already, the, the babies are already born and there's nothing we can do. Then, then he says, okay, fine. Then we'll throw them in the water. Exactly. So it's kind of an interesting story. I think Google it. You can Google birthing stool, search potter's wheel, 
and, uh, and, and investigate it for yourself. But I think it's an interesting story that goes to one of the things that I like to do is study the etymology of some of these words. Um, because I, you know, I, I, what got me to thinking about it was that somebody like Pharaoh is okay with these two ladies lying to him. And you start thinking about it and studying it, you find, well, maybe they weren't being dishonest. Maybe they were being truthful. By the time they got to their rounds, the babies were already born. So interesting little play on words. But nonetheless... Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Thank you. <laughs> Can I go to Chapter 2? Yeah, go ahead. You go ahead and go right. to Chapter so 2, and then have... I'll make my comments on Chapter 2. <laughs> I'll let you interrupt me once, though. No. Okay, we're, we're now in Chapter 2, and there are two people, Jochebed and Amram, and they are Levites. Now, so that Moses is not of the line of Judah. He is a really important guy, but he's a Levite. His parents are, are Levites, and they give birth to him after this edict... And you all know the story. You know he's go. They go ahead, and she builds him a little, a, like a little boat, really, out of papyrus and out of tar, and she, she makes it so that it's waterproof, and then she floats it in the in the Nile, so that he's safe in there, that nothing can jaws can't get at him. And she says, Miriam, you stay right there, and you um, watch. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh's daughter, and there's speculation. I did a little research, too. Good for you. There's speculation that Pharaoh's daughter, or it could have been Pharaoh's wife, that there's some speculation that they're not sure which one it is, was unable to have children. So when she saw this baby, she was just like, I'm taking this baby in. And, of course, Miriam quickly jumps in and says, would you like me to get somebody to nurse it? Now, the, the person who's nursing back then, they nursed children like, like Eli about, no, excuse me, to Samuel, about three years they're nursing these children. So in the very formative times, this mama had, was able to pour into this child mm -hmm. his, his calling in life. But before I throw the ball back, because I like this part, I, I gave you a little homework last week. What does Moses mean? Because John's going to talk a little bit about that he was probably from birth, knew that there was a calling on his life and it means to draw out and I always said yes he was drawn out of the Nile the bigger picture is that he is going to draw God's people out of Egypt he's drawing people out and he's remember they have to to get to a place they have to come out of another place so if he if you will look at him he is the drawer outer of these people from Egypt as he had been drawn out of the water. And I just think that that's really important no, to, to not miss what his name means. So um, I'll pass it back. No, I, and I, I agree. I think names are powerful. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think our, we, I think we live out our name. I agree. I, I believe that is a biblical truth that continues to this day um, because John means, God's gracious gift. <laughs> Had to throw that one in. <laughs> I don't know what Carol means. But Carol does. I'll tell you what it, it means. means My song, father, doesn't it means it? a song of joy. Song of joy. So there I'm, you go. And I'm a happy but no, I do. I think we live out. I think we prophetically live out our names, mm -hmm. and I'm not. But and and I, I I think that's why parents put a lot of emphasis on what name of our our children are going to be. And, and biblically, I think it, mm -hmm. it follows suit. And Moses does mean drawn out. And, and, I, and I also think, you know, as you end in chapter 1, Pharaoh is saying all the male child, all male children are going to be thrown into the Nile. And what happens to Moses? He's thrown into the he Nile. Thrown, just and so I, I, yeah. think, I think, it, I think the, the, it follows suit. And, and he's drawn out, as Carol said, which is, his name means. And I think... Moses then begins on a pathway of of a, a, a feeling, an innate calling of delivering his people. I don't think he quite understood it was God's calling upon his life, the, the Hebrew God calling upon his life until later on in the deserts of Midian when he sees the burning bush. But I think we see as Moses is maturing, he has this sense that he is to be a deliverer, mm -hmm. small d, mm -hmm. deliverer of his people. Um, 
and 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 I and I and I just want before we move on through chapter two, <coughs> I'll, I'll 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 wholeheartedly agree with what Carol said Yahoo! is is that uh, the assumption in that these the Pharaoh dynasties were a pretty inbred clan mm -hmm. Very, that yes. not only were they probably incapable of having children, but incapable of having healthy children. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, of uh, Egyptian dynasty children died early, probably because of all of the inbred kind That's of mentality. That's where hemophilia comes from. And, and when yeah. people inbreed a lot, they have a horrible blood disorder that the children do die. Right. Yes, and so right. probably this concept of, hey, here's a healthy child that I found that I can raise as my own mm -hmm. is probably Spot more on. common yeah. than we want to say just with Moses and Pharaoh's family member, daughter, wife, whatever you want to call her. And so she raises his child. She raises his child. She raises his child. He has healthy upbringing from his mother. Probably, uh, and for for three years, is has great developmental understanding. And then he's transferred to the Pharaoh's house and probably maintains contact with, with his mother slash family who are probably continuing to help raise him in Pharaoh's household. But also in a household where he's being raised as an aristocrat. He is being led to, um, to to learn a lot. He's being educated well. There's some speculation that the reason he was able to lead people is because they trained him to be a leader. Mm -hmm. And so God knew what he was doing. He was even training him while he was in Pharaoh's house, training him later on when he had to go back out in the wilderness when he was with um, in Midian and back to being a shepherd. He goes, So he goes from Israelite to aristocrat back to being a shepherd and it's aristocrats and shepherds wouldn't have gotten together. But when he went back and was with in, in the next land in, in Midian, he went back to shepherding. So it's interesting, all the different hats he's wearing. Don't miss these hats because God's preparing. And you know, it was interesting. Look back over your own life at times when you are being groomed or prepared to see how that's used at the next step. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't want to miss that, John, no, because you're... I think that that's really critically important that this, he's being groomed in a mighty way to lead God's people. Yeah. And, and just to kind of, kind of put it in high speed through the rest of chapter two, yep. he, he, he sees, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Yes. He kills the Egyptian. Again, there's that small D mm -hmm. trying to be a deliverer. Uh, and then he realizes what he's done. He's he's called out on it the next day. He flees and he finds uh, a priest of Midian. And a priest of Midian is probably one of the descendants of Abraham's mm -hmm. other children. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, that's kind of where we get that Midian, Midian line. So these are people that were, mo were I will say, worshiping the Hebrew god, that we don't know his name yet, but the worshiping the Hebrew God of Abraham. And he has these daughters who are being abused by shepherds. And again, small D deliverer again, uh, Moses comes to their rescue. So we see him multiple times um, attempting to deliver people and being small s successful at it. Mm -hmm. and, and he has this inner desire to help people out of strife and how does, and we kind of see that growing in his life and until we find out that there is now a, a, a king in Egypt. Again, he's not called Pharaoh at this point, a king in Egypt um, that has forgotten about Moses. So we have a king that's forgotten about Joseph. And now we have a king, all the people that were alive when Moses killed the Egyptian and, uh, and now he's dead. So we get to chapter 3. So Moses is out tending the flocks of his father Jethro. Can I jump in? Sure, go right in. Okay, so the, I, I, we yeah. planned this ahead of time. <laughs> John talked last week that he was an adult by the time he realized where the 12 tribes came from and why they went in and got the land. I had an aha moment this week when he is out tending the flocks and he sees the burning bush. I never saw that he was on Mount Horeb. The other name for Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. It's used interchangeably. We, as John said earlier, we don't necessarily know where that mountain is now or what that mountain is, but those two names can be used 
interchangeably. I never realized he was there once already in a very monumental event before he went back the second time to get the Ten Commandments. So here, where this bush is appearing to be on fire but not burning up, is the first time he's there, and it, later on, you know, God says to him, you will come back here, and you will have something mighty happen here, and that is, in fact, when he gets the Ten Commandments. So I just wanted to bring that out, and of course, God now starts giving him the, the G-O word, go. And I'm going to kind of pass it back to John, because we, we talked about there are three really important questions that are going to come out of this chapter three, which is the heart, kind of the meat of where we're going. Yeah. And these questions are not only questions that Moses is asking of God and vice versa. They're questions we need to be asking. We right. need to make these questions today a real burning, if you'll pardon the expression from the burning bush, a real burning part of our lives, John. Or I, I, I really sat with these no, questions. This I, I agree, and I think that's yeah. in, in chapter three and four is, like I said, where we want to focus today. And not just do a history lesson right. of the of right. the Israelites in Egypt today, but really say, you know, what principles are there for me? And I think we get into that as we get into chapter three. Right. And the first thing I want to say is, I, I people say to me a lot of time, John, how do I know God's talking right. to me? Exactly. And I think we see over and over and over throughout Scripture, and we see it here in Moses that Moses is unquestionably aware that God's talking to me. Oh, clearly. And I think that's always what I tell people, how I answer that question when it's asked to me, God, how, John, how do I know when God's talking to me? You'll know. Mm -hmm. you, it, it will be unquestionable who who's talking to you. And most of the time, God calls us by our name. And I think in this in this situation, Moses is on the far side of Midian. We don't know north, south, east, or west mm -hmm. where that is, but he's close to the mountain of God. Again, wonderful studies. You can go in and spend volumes have been written on which mountain this is in the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, um, but it doesn't matter. It, but it's the it, God was there, and um, and Moses sees this bush and he moves to the side to look at it. And God says, God calls him by name from within the bush. And Moses responds, here I am. He's kept because his name twice. Mm -hmm. When God says something in scripture twice, you know, mm -hmm. he's it's basically important. saying, listen up, listen to me. And, and you know, I, I want to dovetail on what John said, because we, we may never come upon a burning bush, but we need to have the eyes of the Lord every day. Because he will speak to us. So I just, you know, we, we've all had things happen in our lives that are very, very special. And, and he doesn't, he wants us to know we're special. Which is why, can I do the first question or not? Well, before you okay. get there, I just, I want to, the question I, a lot of times I have is, why couldn't God have left the Israelites in Canaan? Okay. And develop them as a nation there. And I think you see through one of the things that, that God has said throughout the people of Israel is to remain a, a, a holy and righteous people, a people who are separated um, from others, and, and to, to be my people, my people that are going to bless the entire world. And, and one of my explanations is that why they couldn't stay in Canaan, if they'd have stayed in Canaan, they wouldn't have been a, a set-apart people. Exactly. But one of the reasons God was able to set them apart and they could be a people in and of themselves was because they were in Goshen, in Egypt. And, and it says, and then God heard their cries. God saw their misery. In verses 7, it says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians mm -hmm. and deliver them into a land of good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Mm -hmm. And so God heard their cry, God saw their misery, God was concerned about them in suffering as he has asked them to be a special people. And he says, so now I'm going to remove them from Egypt, and Moses, I'm going to use you to be the one, the instrument that draws them out. You, I have called you to be a small D deliverer. You've known that throughout your life. Now you're going to be a big D deliverer. 
And now we get into the questions. And before I get to the questions, I just want you to see, sometimes when God calls you, he, he says to him, go to the elders and they will, they will listen. They will believe you. And so far, Moses is thinking, oh, okay. Then he says later on, but Pharaoh won't. He's immediately telling him there's going to be hardship. Just, just because God is saying your name and calling you to do something, sometimes when I've agreed to do some of the, the hardest things in my life that I believe God's called me to do, the hardship is what, if you will, you know, strength, hones you like, like a knife. And so sometimes we, we, we need the hardship to do that. So the obedience is being built in it. But the first question, and, we're, and like I said, John and I are going to focus on the questions here today, is who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh. So many times when I'm being called to do something, and, and it just happened a year ago when, when God was calling me to do something that I was not comfortable with doing, but I believe he was calling me, I kept saying, who, who am I? Can't you get somebody else to do this, please? And and I, I, I one morning I was really wrestling in my quiet time, and I said, but God, as if to say, but God, I can't do this. And I felt that I heard pretty strongly, that's right, but God. He said, because I'm with you, but I, Carol, am with you, but God. So I was using but God as an excuse. He was saying, it's all about me, mm -hmm. but God. So again, this just really spoke to me a lot this week because he's calling Moses to do something he doesn't want to do. He apparently has a stuttering problem. He's being told to go back to a place where he murdered somebody, that there's a lot of stuff setting up against this guy to go back. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, no, no, I'm telling you to do it. So when he says the first question, who am I? We need to ask that of ourselves. Who are we in Christ? Who are we? Are we filled with his spirit and are we doing his will? Or are we walking the other way? I, mm -hmm. I just didn't no. want to miss that first no, question. No, and I, he asked who, you notice God never answers, literally, literally never answers the question. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> he just ignores the question and says, Moses, I'll be with you. Yeah. And uh, that's all you need to know. So in other words, Moses, I, I'm choosing you. You're important. You're significant. You're valuable to me. But as Carol said, it ain't about you. I'm going to be using you. It's, it's. You are, you are the one that I'm choosing. You are the one that I've called you in the midst of this burning bush. I've called your name twice. I've told you to take your sandals off. Moses, I'm calling you. It's not about you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work powerfully That's through right. you. That's right. And answer. then Moses' second question mm -hmm. is, who are you? Right. <laughs> who am I? But who are you? Who are Listen, you? Keep asking yourself these questions, okay? Yeah, go. No. No, I just love that because now he's kind of trying another tag. He, okay. Okay, you say you're going to be with me. You, you didn't say, you didn't list my qualifications after I said, who am I that I should do this? So then he goes and he said to God, and <coughs> when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God your father has sent me to you, and they say, what is his name? What am I supposed to say? What is his name? As John said, he's basically saying, who, who's he? Wait, if they ask you, who is he? Who sent you here? What do you mean you're being sent here by somebody? Who is that person? Again, God is bigger than that. And so sometimes when I'm faithless, mm -hmm. he will still be faithful. Absolutely. And so he basically issues the first time we see this in scripture, I am who I am, which is another name for Yahweh. Why we put the A and the E in. It, y A H W E H. It used to be Y H W H without the vowels, but we put those in so that we can say the name Yahweh. Okay, and so that's the name for I am who I am, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So yeah, and and I think another way, yeah, and I, it is I am who I am, but another way of translating that is I am being who I am being. Yes. And, and to me, that makes more sense because God, is, I think God is saying to Moses, I am being who I am. I am the God who is being with you. I am the God present. I am present in my presence. I am the one who's hearing the cries of my people. God, I, Moses, I am the one that's standing before you now. John, I'm the one who's with you uh, at all times. I, God, I'm the 
Carol, I'm the God who's with you. I am being who I am being. That's who I am. I have been with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am with the Israelites now hearing their cries, and I will be with them as they wander through the desert, and I will be with them in, in the presence of Jesus. I am the one who is with them always. And I think that just helps me to say, instead of I am who I am, I am being who I am being. I am the God who is present with you. And Let me just bring it present. We, he's in a confusing time. Moses is confused. Mm -hmm. he does, he's shocked about this bush. He's shocked that God's talking to him. He's shocked he's being called to do something. Um, let, let's bring it to the present. We are in a bit of a confusing time in our church, aren't we? You know, we've lost mm -hmm. our head pastor. We have an interim pastor. I can say this because I'm not a pastor, but I'm sitting with one who's doing a wonderful job, by the way. But when we get confused, all we have to do is say, who are you? And he'll say, I am who I am. The same guy who is at the burning bush is with you at First Baptist Church Amen. right now, yeah. leading you forward. Just be obedient. So I just... I, no, I, that's a great point. I needed to bring that to where no. we are now. And again, yeah. that, that's, again, that speaks back to I am being who I am. Right. I am the God who is with you. Right. I am the one who is present with you. And, uh, and I think we need that. And again, in the next, the rest of chapter three, I think just for me to call out that uh, several times God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and yes. Jacob. I'm bringing that lineage. I am the God who has been with you all along, and I'm with you now. And then the close of chapter three, just to kind of reiterate mm -hmm. what we said earlier, that most likely the, the, the Israelites were in some sense equal because it says, it says, say to your neighbors, yeah. give me what you have and they will give it. And to those who serve in your household, give me articles which you have and they're going to give it to you. So there's this concept that God is saying to Moses, they're going to be taken care of. They, they, were ne they weren't necessarily slaves as we think traditionally that word means in our culture, but somehow they were... They were on an equal level with the Egyptian folks, even though they were down in Goshen. And I just want to say, I'm doing Exodus with another group too, and we're a little ahead of this one. Uh -oh. Remember these items that are being mm -hmm. pulled out. They will be misused They'll at some back. point, and then they're going to be used for the tabernacle. So that the, when God's telling them to take these things, it's not just so that they'll have some pretty things to wear when they travel. There's a reason for it. So just, there's never not a reason in God's kingdom. You know? Okay, yeah. you want to go to chapter four? Chapter four. four. Okay. Then just kind of wrapping it up. Chapter Last four. Question. Moses says, um, Moses says, what if they don't believe me? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think um, just, a, just a great devotional thought. God asks Moses, what are you holding in your hand? Yeah. And, and Moses says, it's a staff, a shepherd's staff, something... He's probably had around with him for 40 years, something that every shepherd has, something, you know, you and I have those things that we carry with us all the time. And and God says, what's that in your hand? And and Moses says, a staff, and God says to throw it down. And great, you've heard this illustration so many times, it's well-worn, but I think it's powerful enough for us to revisit it again. And And it turns into a snake. And, and then God says to pick it back up. And, and I always have to, in my own mind, have to think after Moses runs back from the other sand dune, he, <laughs> he, he picks it up and it becomes a staff again. And, um, and snakes in Egypt were usually asps, ASP, mm -hmm. and they're very, very venomous, real vipers. Yeah. So that this is not just a little black race or garden snake, I don't think. Right. I think this was a scary snake, and God is again building this man. Right, and 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 you see, um, and Moses picks it back up at the command of God, and and then we see in ver later on in um, um, we we'll come back, but then later on in verse twenty, it says, "So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt." And he took the staff of God in his hand. Um, no longer is it called just a staff or Moses' staff. Uh, and we're going to see this staff of God reappear throughout the rest of yes. Exodus in the life of Moses, where God uses it 
as a symbolic reminder to Moses that God's with him and that God has called him to be the deliverer with a capital D. And, and so I think just devotionally for me, it's important to remember that we all have these things in our hands. And at some point, God asks us to lay them down and get rid of them. And, and I think I just want to stop there and say, sometimes God asks you to pick it back up. And sometimes God says, to leave it on the ground. Let that snake crawl away. And, and I think so many times, confessatorily, God said to lay something down, and I just kind of stand over it with my hand waiting for God to say to pick it back up. And sometimes he doesn't. And in this situation with Moses and the staff, he does. He commands God to pick it back up. And then you have that wonderful illustration that whatever God blesses, God can use in powerful ways. And um, But sometimes God says to leave it on the ground. And, um, and I think there's where we are in the calling of God, that God calls Moses. God had this, under, excuse me, Moses had this understanding that he was going to be a deliverer. He was going to free his people. He was going to help his people, help them out of bondage. Didn't quite understand how that calling was going to be utilized until some 80 years later, if you want to say, after 40 years in the house of Pharaoh and 40 years in the Median Desert. Finally, Moses gets the understanding of, okay, this is how God's going to use me as his servant in the calling upon my life. And, and he begins to live that out. And I think for us, it's, it's being obedient and being, and continuing as Moses said, as Carol said, to ask, who am I and who are you that, that you're going to use us? Which brings us to the last question. Well, the you last thought I question. forgot. No, I, I wasn't going <laughs> to let you forget because I like the last question a lot because it has a lot of implication. He's, he's had this amazing revelation from God. And then in verse chapter uh, 4, verse 1, he said, But suppose they don't believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Isn't that just like Satan? To when, when you really believe you're supposed to do something, what if they don't believe you? They're just going to think you're a quack. Don't you know? What do you mean God appeared to you in a burning <laughs> bush? That He's questioning himself. He questions himself even further when he says, I can't speak. I can't do this. At that point, God's got to be getting a little upset with him after all these things that he's shown them. God doesn't let him go. Not only does he not let him go, he says, look, here comes your brother Aaron. He speaks well. I'll let him go with you. I just love it how sometimes when I start to get real shaky, God brings somebody next to me and mm -hmm. says, I'm going to encourage you, Carol. And I've had some of the most incredible encouragers in my life. And so the last thing besides the question of what if they don't believe me, God brings an encourager next to him to go with him. I have to also ask myself, am I encouraging people? Mm -hmm. I need to be that encourager. I need to also be an Aaron. If I'm not a Moses, who's the, a great leader, I know I need to be an encourager, Absolutely. you know, and so I just, I just don't want us to miss that from the last question either. Go no, ahead. great yeah. point. I think, and that, and that's kind of where we're ending with Moses today in, in chapter, end of chapter four, we'll, we'll pick up with chapter five next week and, and talk about uh, the plagues and, and those things. But, but I, I just encourage you to go back and, and kind of take kind of the thoughts that Carol and I have brought out today. And, and read chapters 1 through 4 of Exodus just in, in, a, in one city. Just read mm -hmm. it and allow God to speak through you, to you, as God spoke to Moses. And, and I strongly believe that in the same way God called out Moses and had a task for him, God has a task for me, has a task for Sarah. Carol has a task for you <laughs> to, to, yeah, to, to do what God wants you to do. Amen. And, and I think so many times in my life, and I know in your all's life, you've said what Moses said in chapter 13. God, just to use somebody else. Exactly. I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this, God. After all these miracles, you've done my hand thing and the staff, the serpent thing. God showed me. I still, just God, use somebody else. Don't use me. And, and I think God comes along and says, no, it's my task I have for you, and I want you to fulfill it. And you can see how God then continues to use Moses 
He wants to use you. And I say we make our lives available to him. So with that, that's chapter one through four of, uh, of Exodus. I hope it speaks to you. Spoke to me this week. I tell you what, those three questions really got me yeah. a thinking, if you will. A thinking. <laughs> there you go. So God bless you. Be wise. Be safe out there. Put your masks on. And let's always be the church. God bless you. See you next week.